And I decided it was important to, to do something that mattered in the world and give back to this community. When I started volunteering for the local LGBT center, um, going into the classroom talking about gay stereotypes, how they affect um, discrimination. So I, I started to get a voice uh, about this subject and get excited. Um, and so then the FAIR Act got passed. And it has to do with that they need to include LGBT history and social studies in the public school curriculum in California starting now. They don't have money for it. So I thought, you know, we're going to talk a lot about gay men. You know they are. So why don't we talk about lesbians who created culture and, you know, this is, these are the shoulders of the women that we're all standing on now as um, queer people in, in a much more accepting society. So the women that were in my generation, we have big stories to tell about what our lives were like and how hard that was. So this became my passion project, to do this book, to get into the schools, and how am I going to do this? Here I am like a curator, editor, designer, graphic designer, but I don't really know much about writing, so I, but I know how to get people to tell their stories. So I invited all these awesome women to like tell me a little bit about themselves. So then I thought, well, how am I going to pay for this? So I thought, oh, crowdfunding, right? And I'm like, whoa, that is the scariest, most, it, don't try to do crowdfunding if you have a day job and you're kind of insecure <laughs> and you don't really know that much about it. But I realized I've been given back all this time to, with Apocalypse, e-magazine, whatever, um, promoting everyone's business and promoting everyone's events and just because I thought it was interesting. So I figured it's okay to ask, you know. So I went out and I asked, I raised $20,000. Um, why lesbians? Well, a lot of people co contacted me and said, you have to use that ugly word. It's really ugly. And I'm like, wow, is it? You know, because when I came out, that was the only word there was. We didn't have the choice of like being queer or somewhere in between or fluid or, it was all about, you choose, gay, straight, do you like girls or not? You know, and I was like, I like girls. You know, it's, it's disappearing now, it's not in vogue, and that's cool, you know, but I, I'm just interested in like keeping the history alive, like so that we know where we came from, we know why uh, things are the way they are now, and as open as accepting as they are, there's a lot of room for that to go further. So, there's a nice quote in here by my friend Bonnie Morris, she's in the book, she says, most historians still fail to inscribe the accomplishments of lesbian pioneers in our textbooks. And that's the idea that there's nothing in the textbooks about anything. If you, like, just this year they went to Sacramento and fought to include LGBT history in the textbooks. Like, the fight for gay marriage was simply not in there. It's like, how do you teach history and not talk about major things that happen in our culture? Well, they want to just erase it, you know? And so we're not, we're not putting up with it. That's why the book, so... I just wanted to start with Kathy, who has extensive background in uh, the culture of the women that these women in this book, the shoulders they stood on, and, and how it all kind of started in the 50s and 60s. She's going to talk a little bit about that. Thanks, everybody, for coming. Uh, so first, my disclaimer, I didn't live through this time. <laughs> uh, but it's definitely been an interest of mine since, uh, since I came out, really, because for me, I really wanted to know about the history and culture where I came from. Um, and so the first thing that I want to talk about is lesbian pulp fiction. I have a personal collection of more than 100 of these lesbian pulp novels. Pulp fiction, the reason we call it pulp fiction is the paper that it was printed on. And uh, this started after the war uh, in the 50s, and there was all genres of pulp fiction. There was science fiction, there was murder mysteries, there was um, true stories and things like that. And they were, this was like the first time books were sold to a mass audience in um, bus depots and in drugstores and things like that. And they were easy to pick up and they were cheap. And you could, you know, the idea was you would read it and you would just like leave it on the bus seat when you were done with it. And in the 1950s, gold medal was, uh, kind of started printing these racy books with these sexy themes to them. And they were written primarily by men um, for a male audience. Um, a lot of them using pseudonyms, women pseudonyms. Um, but some of them were actually written by women. The Women's Barracks uh, was the first book that came out, and it, it was like wildly popular. As a matter of fact, uh, it got called up before the House Un-American Activities Committee in 1953 uh, for being pornographic. And of course, this helped the sales of the book. <laughs> and then launched this whole genre of lesbian fiction. 
there was always something in the books, though, that was a little bit, uh, that had to have like a moral stance. It had to kind of be against, you know, being queer in a way. And Valerie Taylor, who is one of the authors who came out later as lesbian, um, uh, said this about what her editor told her. He said, the only restriction he gave me was it couldn't have a happy ending, otherwise the post office might seize the books as obscene. Um, but still, women found these books and they were able to read through the stories um, and see themselves. And I have a quote from Catherine Forrest, who some of you may know, she was a writer of uh, lesbian fiction in the 80s. Lesbian pulp fiction paperback first appeared before my disbelieving eyes in Detroit, Michigan, 1957. I did not need to look at the title for clues. A young woman with sensuous intent on her face, seated on a bed, leaning over a prone woman, her hands on the other woman's shoulders. Overwhelming need led me to walk a gantlet of fear up to the cash register. Fear so intense that I remember nothing more, only that I stumbled out of the store in possession of what I knew I must have, a book to me as necessary as air. The book was Odd Girl Out by Ann Bannon. I found it when I was 18 years old. It opened the door to my soul and told me who I was there. And so I think um, when we look through, we look back at history, I think sometimes we look through it through our own lens, but to put yourself back in that time period where, I mean, there was nothing. So to find these books was really a lifesaver for these women. Um, have any of you seen the movie, yeah. Carol, <laughs> which was based on one of these lesbian pulp fictions from um, 1952, I believe, The Price of Salt. Where was it, like, wasn't Price of Salt the first one with a positive uh, Okay. It, yeah, it was actually, yeah, it was uh, touted as one of the first books that had a positive outcome because the two ended up together in the end. Uh, so they had the words like shadow, stranger, odd, twisted, so that women, like people would know what they were going to find in these books. Um, and one of the big things that these books depicted at the time was the lesbian and bar scene. Uh, the bar culture of the time. And it, it, there was mixed things here. Women could come to the bars to, to be free, find a sense of community, meet friends, you know, maybe pick up a lover. But, um, but I like this woman right here. Look at her. Look at the look on her face. <laughs> she's, she's totally lusting at her. Her. <laughs> what do you think? Sorry. <laughs> um, so the bar scene, kind of like, I mean, we don't really have lesbian bars anymore, which is really sad, but back in, in the 50s, I mean, they were sometimes a sad place, and, but they were the place where a woman could go and let her guard down and be who she was and flirt and all these things you couldn't do out in the straight world. You would lose your job. You could, you could literally be arrested, um, you know, thrown from your families. It was, it was a pretty uh, a different time. These bars were often in like dark warehouse districts. They were often owned by the mafia. And I'm sure all of you know that they were often raided by the police. For example, there was a, a raid of a bar uh, in the 1960s and um, like 36 women were arrested on charges of like attending a house of ill repute. You had to wear the three pieces yep. of clothing yep. of your appropriate gender or you could be arrested for that. So who's wearing boxers and... <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I think I would be arrested right now. Even my shoes are. Because different cities have different laws and whatnot. In some cities it was illegal for two, the same sex to be dancing together. So when the cops would come, there was a certain bar, I think it was in Los Angeles, that this red light would come on and the, the couples knew to switch partners then and dance you know, with an opposite sex. There was also kind of an expectation of butch femme uh, at a lot of the clubs, and women. Some women felt like they they really needed to choose in order to fit in. So while we were creating this community where women could be themselves, like not all women could. You know, some women did totally embrace that um, idea of butch femme. And I have a, a really great quote here from Joe Nessel, who, if you don't know, is this wonderful femme writer. And there was a lot of backlash towards the butch femme uh, scene, especially in the 80s, and this was kind of her response to that. 
The butch femme relationship as I experienced with them were complex erotic statements but not, and not phony heterosexual replicas. They were filled with a deeply lesbian language of stance, dress, gesture, loving courage, and autonomy. None of the butch women I was with, and this included passing women, ever presented themselves to me as men. So there's these two women, uh, Del Martin and Phyllis Lyon, who in the 1950s wanted to create an alternative to the bar scene. They wanted a place to socialize, meet other women to dance. Uh, so in 1955, they started Daughters of Belitis. Organizations popped up in many different cities. And they published this uh, magazine called The Ladder, which I think was the first lesbian publication in the United States. And women around the country would receive this in this plain brown wrapper. And, um, and it was literally a lifeline for women across the country to find that there were other people like them. And they quickly realized that they needed to not just be involved in like social things, but in social change. And that's what Daughters of Belitis came and kind of became the, um, the, the starting point for kind of the lesbian and queer rights movement with the Mattachine Society, which also started up around the same time. And Della and Phyllis became activists, their whole, state activists their whole lives. They were part of it because they were the first couple that was married in San Francisco in, in 2004 when, when gay marriage became legal. So anyway, that's kind of what I have to say. And I think we'll have time at the end for questions if people yeah. have them. But. So I, I ended up highlighting all these great women and there's, there's the first one. This is Monica Palacios. And I had a lot of fun with it. I think I was inspired by the Pulp Fiction graphic novel style-ish. And um, like I said, my, her deal was that she was named, they named it um, Monica Palacios Day, the mayor of LA, for her 30-year career as a pioneering Chicana lesbian performer. And then <laughs> I get to Jewel Gomez, who is one of the women um, one of the rooms here is named after her. She's a, she's a good friend. She's an amazing woman. And I wanted to just read her story really quickly. Like, this is what I asked them to tell me about. What was your big aha moment? She said, images have a big place in the way I define myself. A paper bag is where it started. I moved to New York City right after college in 1971, and although I was a lesbian from an early age, at least eight years old, I was too shy to join the Gay Pride March. I'd heard the marchers go by in my West Village flat, but I didn't know any lesbians, and I'd seen movies, read the books. Lesbians were best invisible and at worst demonized. But I didn't feel ashamed, only befuddled. Growing up poor and colored, I already knew the world was a scary place, so I took after my Native American great-grandmother. I watched and waited for the moment that felt right for the people who were my people. Finally, one day I decided, go down to the march, stand on the sidewalk. I watched for a while, with my eyes filling with tears as each contingent went by. Then I saw a group of New York City school teachers marching, most of them with brown paper bags over their heads. They refused to stand on the sidewalk, even though they knew it wouldn't mean the end of their careers. I was filled with so many feelings I could barely stand up, fury that they had to cover their faces, pride that they didn't stay home, embarrassed that I'd been too shy. Next thing I knew, I'd thrown myself into the middle of the stream of queer humanity as, it's made, as it made its way down Fifth Avenue. And I haven't missed a march since or forgotten personal is political. Now, she and her partner um, became one of the first defendants for the gay marriage that they were married, and then, like I was married, many of you may know about that, but we went down to City Hall, got married in that little window, and my kids were there, and they were so excited. They were like, this means you can be together forever, you know? Of course, that wasn't the case. <laughs> but um, the point is, it meant a lot to the kids. I mean, think about that. And, and then, you know, a few weeks later, we received in the mail the annulment, which was when they changed the law. So we got our money back, and we got our certificate saying we were annulled. Unbelievable. Um, okay, so then she wrote these fantastic books about lesbian, what else? Lesbian vampires, why not? <laughs> now, uh, Mariah Hansen is a, is a friend, and she's a, an amazing woman. Obviously, she does the Dinah. And what she ended up doing was, was discovering all these great acts. And I don't know if you know, she was the first one to show Lady Gaga, Katy Perry. Um, now this woman, Donna Hitchens, oh my gosh, she is fantastic. She's the first out lesbian elected judge, but she also literally wrote the book on how to defend um, two-parent adoption, which, which was close to my heart. When we first had our kids, like, so my partner, 
we used my brother for the donor. This is 1990. Uh, and so here comes baby Max, you know, and we had to fill out our birth certificate. We had, she had to put unknown for the father. There was all these legal ramifications around how to do that. And we had to, she had to be the only mother. And then we had to go to court and like actively petition that I became the mother. And the judge would like scold us and say, are you sure you want to give up your right to that child? It's like, it was just this awful thing or else she couldn't have gone to school and pick him up, say you need to go to the hospital. And then later I had my own child, not with my brother. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> we used an unknown donor for him. He, they, neither of the kids are gay either, which is awesome. I think we all like girls. <laughs> so Franco, who did Curve Magazine, who Kathy worked for, she, she, she's an amazing person. Um, this is Judy DeLugas, who does Olivia. I've been on many cruises. Um, I don't know if you've ever done this, but it's super fun. Um, yeah, it's really worth it. Um, this cracks me up. Um, in the year 2000, they went to Turkey. I went to Turkey with them three years ago, but it wasn't quite like this. But when they first went there, they were on the cover of every uh, newspaper in Turkey. Um, lesbians are here, you know. <laughs> and they had, um, they pumped more than half a million dollars into the local economy that was lagging. So it was a big deal. Look at these women, look at what they're wearing. Look at them all in, so good. Okay. Uh, then Jenny Olsen is amazing. So she's an authority on LGBTQ film and writing. Now, Kate Kendall. I don't know if many of you know her from NCLR. This is when Dell and, well, I guess Dell had already passed away. So yeah. this is Phyllis Lyon. Kate Kendall was instrumental in, in getting that to happen. NCLR defended it. Um, now, here's Kathy's page. Look at Kathy's dog. Oh, <laughs> the love of her life. Teens. She, she wrote a book, and I'm going to read you what they said in Goodreads. It says, teen life is hard enough with all the pressure kids face. But for teens who are LGBT, it's even harder. When do you decide to come out? To whom? Will your friends accept you? How on earth do you meet people to date? Queer is a humorous, engaging, and honest guide that helps LGBT uh, teens come out to friends and family, navigate new LGBT social life, figure out if a crush is also queer, and rise up against bigotry and homophobia. So it's not just about STDs, right? So this is the first time that was done, which is amazing. Okay, now Marga is an old, old friend. I've known her since she's when she first started comedy. And she wrote this hilarious story. Uh, it was 1994. I'd been doing stand-up comedy for 10 years when the legendary comedian and gay ally Robin Williams invited me to, for to perform on HBO's Comic Relief. I said, totally, but my head was terrified, not so much about making my television debut, but about coming out to the world. I was great at already being out, but coming out required muscles I hadn't developed. I never got to come out to my parents. When I was 19, they caught me with my, and me and my friend smooching. Rather than deal with their homophobic drama, I quit school, left my home in New York, moved to San Francisco where everyone assumed you were LGBT. <laughs> there was nobody to come out to there. So I started performing at a local gay comedy club, which led to playing pride rallies all over the country. Soon I became lesbian famous without ever having to come out. Then I got the HBO gig. Coming out on television was uncharted territory in 1994. This was before Ellen came out, before the L word. My agent gave me typical advice. You can be a lesbian in Hollywood, just don't bring it up. If I'd listen to him, I might be a rich lady today. <laughs> but just before I stepped in front of the television cameras, I remembered my 19-year-old self packing her suitcase, escaping her family, and feeling scared and alone. And I knew that she would want what she would want me to do. So I said, hi folks, let me tell you about myself. I'm part Cuban, part Puerto Rican, part lesbian, and I'm not in the labels. I only bring it up because I know some of you folks have a problem with Cubans. <laughs> <laughs> so she has, oh my gosh, she has this fantastic woman show right now. It's playing in San Francisco and getting rave reviews. So if you ever have a chance to see that, it's so worth it. And this is uh, Diane Anderson Mitchell. She's now the editor of uh, The Advocate. And here's just my list of folks. 